I'd like to call the Common Council meeting to order. This is our ninth regular meeting of the 2019-2020 Council uh, year. Would the clerk re re please read the quote for the day? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Things work out best for those that make the best of how things work out. Thank you very much for that. Would the clerk please call the roll? There are nine present. Uh, Alderperson Phillips is excused. Please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Well, welcome everyone. Before we get going with the rest of our agenda, I'd like to have uh, City Attorney Charles Adams just give us a little reminder about the rules of order for this meeting. So the rules of order uh, uh, for the general public, which also includes uh, all the aldermen and the uh, elected officials, does, uh, there are a couple things just to be aware of. Uh, first of all, uh, only the person who has the floor has the, the right to speak, so don't uh, react or, uh, you know, uh, enter into applause or, or shout out uh, to, to the person, but rather just listen to the person who uh, is speaking. Uh, the people who are speaking sh should address their comments to the uh, older persons uh, rather than to members of the public. Um, and we don't we don't allow uh, banners and um, you know things like that uh, in in the building. So uh, during the meeting, just because they can be a distraction and they, they can get in the way of uh, people being able to to see. So um, that's kind of the basics. Thank you very much. Next, we'll move on to the approval of minutes from the last council meeting. Alder Person Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to approve. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. All those, is there any discussion on those minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Next, we'll move on to a presentation, which is an update on the Fresh Tech Innovation District by Chad Pelichek, Director of Planning and Development. Thank you, Mayor and Common Council. If you can go to the next slide. So what we wanted to do today is give you an update of the Fresh Tech Innovation District and what's in the works and what's being planned as we move forward. So the Fresh Tech Innovation District is what's been planned for the area where the former Kepsel building used to be on Indiana Avenue, uh, basically east of South, 9th, South 10th Street um, on the property directly west of the former Sprecher. Um, the Innovation District, as you can see, is, the mission is to provide the core programming and coordination necessary to catalyze support and invigorate the local in, in innovation ecosystem. If you can go to the next slide. So there's four major initiatives that are currently underway. Um, this is a partnership between the City of Sheboygan and the Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation. Um, we both of these two organizations have contracted with the ETUD group who is currently uh, completing a makerspace study. Um, a makerspace for those that don't know is a place where people with shared interests, especially in commuting, uh, computing and technology can gather to work on projects while sharing ideas, equipment and knowledge. So the idea is a place similar to a YMCA where you can pay a membership in and you can go with like minded people and do technology things, do engineering, th those kind of things under one roof. Uh, the goal of the study is to determine a core group of residents interested in spearheading the development of the makerspace in Sheboygan on a grassroots level and hopefully bring it to fruition as a place where people can uh, buy into and, and do these types of activities. The second um, the second thing that the SCEDC is leading the charge on is there's 30 uh, representatives from Sheboygan County Company, leaders within those companies that are developing programming centered around um, information received from the Innovation District Summit last fall. So the three things that came out of that summit that was held were 150 people came together and brainstormed on things that they would like to see uh, happen as a part of the programming piece uh, was professional and leadership development, uh, best practices and collaboration and entrepreneurship and innovation. So 
The idea is that these three uh, groups will, there's subcommittee groups working on each of these uh, core uh, programming initiatives and they'll be rolling out programming as it relates to those three things uh, to try to use as a talent retention and talent attraction for our local companies. Next slide. Another, in, another initiative of the SCEDC is they've contracted with a group called Innovate2 to conduct a feasibility study on how they can leverage university and college students, business leaders, and entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs and other kinds of innovators to work together uh, to, be able to be, able, be able to bring this kind of collaborative working environment and student-run businesses to the district. So Innovate2 is a group out of Milwaukee that's currently working with Marquette and uh, UW-Milwaukee on this type, the same type of model, and they're doing a feasibility study here to see if they can partner with the local institutions of higher learning and uh, bring that same kind of model within the district. The city of Sheboygan is implementing uh, five or six key redevelopment initiatives in this district. The addition of affordable apartment housing and condominiums, some infrastructure updates, relocation of existing uh, business and purchase of some additional real estate, the addition of a pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure, an update to the master plan, and the addition of some new buildings. So if you go to the next slide. The former Coakley Warehouse, as you see it today, is under construction. That was the Badger State Tannery that's under construction of 118 affordable housing units and 8,700 square feet of commercial space. The budget, project budget for that is $30 million. The project is slated to be completed sometime in the summer of 2020. And recently, the Planning Commission approved 21 new condominium units on South Pier to break ground this fall on a property east of the Sea Rice Coal Company at the entrance to <coughs> South Pier at a project budget of $6 million. Next slide. The Public Works Department is working on the reconstruction of Illinois Avenue, Maryland Avenue, Commerce Street, and North 11th Street surrounding the Badger State Lofts. That project is $3.5 million. It went out to bid and it came in over budget, so it's going to be rebid sometime in September. And then the Redevelopment Authority um, and the city recently approved the uh, s purchase of the former Craft 30. Craft 30 is currently operating in this building on 10th Street right now. Their plan is to move to 908 Michigan Avenue in the fall of 2020. And then this Redevelopment Authority will ultimately demolish this building and make way for some new buildings. We also have purchase offers to purchase out on two homes directly north of Craft 30 um, to demolish those as well and create a development site at a value of $140,000. Next slide. The Common Council recently approved a purchase and sale agreement with the Union, Union Pacific Railroad to uh, purchase right away of a former railroad from basically Pennsylvania Avenue to Union Avenue and then adjacent to Indiana Avenue. Um, the price of that is $1.2 million. We're currently in the due diligence phase doing a survey, which will be approved later on in the agenda tonight, as well as some environmental assessments. The goal is to close on the acquisition of the real estate sometime in early 2020. We also are working with a developer to develop the first new building in the district, a mixed-use office building. It will be a Class A office and co-working space. Um, on the master plan, the building that's highlighted in purple is where this new building would be planned adjacent to Indiana Avenue and kind of provide some of the programming space that could happen as part of these initiatives. We're also working on an update to the uh, Innovation District Master Plan. We had originally did a master plan for what this area would look like um, after consideration of not moving forward with a parking structure but trying to build a parking lot, a surface parking lot, which is more cost effective in our uh, books. Is that, uh, and then the putting of the, the siting of the buildings along the perimeter because in the original plan we did not have craft 30 in those um, in those houses included in that uh, so we're working with a, a cons we'll be working with a consultant soon to update the master plan to show to prospective developers of what the site will look like and then th this is just a up as this is a repeat sorry this is basically providing uh, a space for that part parking, and then some outdoor programming features. 
If you're interested in learning more and following the progress of the Fresh Tech Innovation District, you can visit freshtechinnovation.com. Um, and it provides all the updates as part of this process through the Sheboygan County EDC. So thank you. Chad, thank you very much for that report. Next item on the agenda is public forum. And I just want to apologize that we only take five speakers at every council meeting as a maximum. I know many of you have called and wanted to speak. And I hope that uh, people that uh, are on the list will represent many of your views. City Clerk. The first person is Ryan Berg. <clears throat> Will you please state your name and address? Sure. My name is Ryan Berg. It's spelled B-U-R-G. And my address is 711 Superior Avenue, Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Thank you. You'll have five minutes. Good evening, Mayor Vandersteen, President Wolf, Vice President Donahue, and Common Council members. Before you tonight is a proposed ordinance banning the use of so-called reparative or conversion therapy in the city of Sheboygan. As a parent, as a taxpayer, and as a person of faith, I rise in strong support of this ordinance. Why, you may ask. Because my wife, Chris, and I are parents of two amazing queer children. Our youngest, Alex, is going to be 18 next month. Now, his coming out story was so millennial. He announced that he was a pansexual, that is, having an attraction towards someone regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity on Facebook. Then he told us. <laughs> then there was our oldest, who has given me the permission to call her Katie for the purpose of, of this speech. It's important a little bit later on. We named her some 21 years ago. We were so proud of our daughter. She was an incredibly kind-hearted, a talented musician, had a love of reading and an easy laugh. But she wasn't living an authentic life. When she graduated from high school, she was excited to go on to university. For her, it was an opportunity to be independent, except when she needed money or a ride home. But it didn't work out that way. She seemed off. While she was never the most outgoing, she was more distant than before. She often was depressed when we talked to her. My wife and I tried to get her to open up, even suggesting therapy. She declined. Her grades at university suffered, and she was eventually suspended at the end of her first year. When she returned home, things still weren't quite right at least as far as Chris and I were concerned. While saying she was relieved to be home instead of school, things still seemed off. Then last October, National Coming Out Day of all, of all days, she announced to us that they are gender fluid and prefer to be named Max. This combined with an earlier announcement saying that they were asexual was a double whammy for Chris and me. Well, it was more for me than for her even though I'm quite liberal in my beliefs. The thought of, quote, losing my little girl was hard to take. I wondered and even asked if this was a phase. For those of you who have kids in the LGBT community, you know that's probably one of the worst things you can say because that can destroy them, and it almost did my relationship with my child. So what did I do to try to repair, repair things? I learned, I listened. I asked around. I talked to people I knew in the LGBT, LGBTQIA community, religious and counseling communities, as well as doing my research online. Nowhere did I find evidence, especially empirical, that said conversion therapy was effective in improving the mental health of LGBTQIA youth. In fact, I found there was a greater risk of harm when a family rejects their youth. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics in January 2009, high rates of family rejection were significantly out associated with poor health outcomes. On the basis of odds ratios, lesbian, gay, and bisexual young adults who reported higher levels of family rejection during adolescence were 8.4 times more likely to report having attempted suicide, 
six times more likely to report high levels of, of depression, and three and a half more times likely to use illegal drugs and have unprotected sex. This is compared to families who had no or low levels of family rejection. Now I want to make it clear in my one minute that I have left, I understand the argument that as parents, we should be given the maximum amount of freedom in determining what's best for our children. However, the evidence from non-sectarian sources supporting conversion therapy simply isn't there. I wish I had a lot longer than five minutes to talk about my kids, as this really feels like I'm oversimplifying things. They're not perfect because they live their authentic life. Max and Alex have each other own issues like most of us did at their age. Max doesn't clean their room and Alex needs to do his homework. But they don't have the added burden of being forced to become something they're not. Something which would cause them more harm than good. And with that, I strongly urge you, Alders, to support this tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Thank you. Thank you. Christine Smith? Would you please state your name and address for us? Uh, Christine Smith, 1628 Mead Avenue, Sheboygan. Thank you. You'll have five minutes. I'm in Trey Mitchell's district. Where is it? <laughs> Hi, my name is Dr. Christine Smith, and I'm a professor of psychology, uh, human development, and women's and gender studies at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. And yes, I have a long commute. Um, I have taught, researched, and published extensively on LGBT lives and experiences. It's one of my areas of expertise. I hope you will ban conversion therapy for children and adolescents and adults. If you just throw that in. Um, I want to read what the American Psychiatric Association, the American Psychological Association, and the National Association of Social Workers has to say about conversion therapy for children and adolescents. First, same gender sexual orientation, including identity, behavior, and or attraction, and variations in gender identity and expression are part of the normal spectrum of human diversity and do not constitute a mental disorder. Second, as my, the previous speaker mentioned, none of the existing research supports the premise that mental and behavioral health interventions can alter gender identity or sexual orientation. Third, interventions aimed at outcomes such as gender conformity or heterosexual orientation, including those aimed at changing gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation are coercive, can be harmful and should not be part of behavioral health treatments. Directing the child to be conforming to any gender expression or sexual orientation, or directing the parents to place uh, pressure for specific gender expressions, gender identities, and sexual orientations are inappropriate and reinforce harmful gender and sexual orientation stereotypes. And I might add, practicing conversion therapy is considered to be unethical. According to the American Psychological Association, American Psychiatric Association, American Counseling Association, and the National Association of Social Workers. So in summary, the professional fields that specialize in mental and behavioral health conclude that conversion therapy does not work, it is harmful, and it's unnecessary because being LGBT is part of the diversity of human experience. So I hope you will vote to ban conversion therapy for children and adolescents. Thank you. Thank you. Eileen Bailey. <clears throat> If you could state your name and address for us, please. Eileen Bailey, address 1117 Harry Court, Sheboygan. Thank you. You'll have five minutes. Okay. Mayor Vandersteen and Alder people, I am opposed to the proposed ban on so-called conversion therapy. To me, it is a ban on free speech and freedom of religion. 
actually a ban on truth-telling. I do not think it is a necessary nor a helpful piece of legislation. Now, I'm not here to support or promote the outdated, radical treatments or practices that some people think of when they hear the term conversion therapy, the ice pick lobotomies and electroconvulsive or shock therapy, or chemical castration with hormonal treatments, etc. However, conversion therapy also includes talk therapy based on truth. More recent clinical techniques used in the United States have been limited to counseling, visualization, social skills, psychoanalytic therapy, and spiritual interventions, such as prayer and support groups. Parents of young children and adolescent gender-confused individuals and really anyone of any age should be permitted to seek the therapy they desire. In addition, counselors ought to have the permission to give advice and information according to their conscience. School curriculum is promoting transgender as being normal. There are teachers who have come out before their students as being transgender, and on the increase, it seems as a result, children are questioning whether they're really male or female. A recent report by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention suggests that up to 2% of students in high school now identify as non-binary or trans. We also have the medical profession prescribing puberty-blocking drugs, cross-sex hormones, and even surgical interventions that are irreversible medical practices. Dr. Michelle Cotella, Executive Director of the American College of Pediatrics and a pediatrician with a special interest in behavioral pediatrics, serves on the Medical Committee of the Alliance for Therapeutic Choice and Scientific Integrity and has served on the Board of Directors of the National Association for Research and Therapy for Homosexuality. She is alarmed by the bombardment of the transgender messages that are being directed as youth today. A study out of Brown University demonstrated that gender confusion is socially contagious in the same way that violence, sexual intercourse, sexual behavior, and even suicide are socially contagious among youth. She believes that peers matter and what peers are saying, thinking, and doing gets imitated. And we know, according to science, the sex of a person is determined by the genes that individual chromosomes at fertilization. Some people might, some critics might say, well, there are intersex conditions that must be considered. But those genetic birth defects are not new sexes. In other words, there are some people who are using an unfortunate tragedy a congenital birth defect to promote insanity. People cannot change their gender. There are some who bravely attempted to do so and later regretted the terrible mistake they made. There are also reports that 90% of trans youth, if not encouraged in going down that path by adulthood will come to accept and live there as their birth gender. Milwaukee earlier this year passed, its common council passed a conversion therapy ban. And it prevents anyone from helping families that want to explore all options when their child experiences questions or confusion Excuse over me, their I gender your time is up. identity. So I would urge that our older people vote against the ban. Thank you.
Beth Cunard. Could you please state your name and address? My name is Beth Cunard. I live at 74 Lincoln Avenue, and I'm here to speak against the conversion therapy ban ordinance that you will be voting on. I'm here to speak against it based on these reasons. The therapy ban ordinance denies minors and their parents the right to freely choose their own therapeutic goals. They are restricted. Patients who struggle with unwanted same-sex attractions or unresolved gender dysphoria are denied access to therapy that affirms their identity and goals while patients who identify as LGBT have free access to therapy that affirms their goals. When the government plays favorites in this way, it engages in unconstitutional viewpoint discrimination. This therapy ban ordinance imposes the government's own political viewpoint about adolescence and sexuality on patients and mental health professionals. Secondly, parents have the constitutionally protected right to direct the care and upbringing of their children, including decisions about medical treatment. The city of Sheboygan does not belong between a counselor and his client. This therapy ordinance is very illogical. A parent is allowed to obtain professional counseling for their child for unwanted depression, unwanted social anxiety, and even unwanted heterosexual attraction, but is denied treatment for the child who has unwanted same-sex attractions. The language of this proposal wrongly limits the free exercise of religion. Some of those who seek counseling to address sexual orientation or gender identity do so for religious reasons. That is, their religious belief informs them that they should not act upon same-sex attractions or that they should seek to live consistent with their God-given biological sex. And some counselors who offer such counseling therapy likewise do so for religious reasons. This proposal will limit the free exercise of religion for these patients and providers. Churches and faith-based counseling centers will be charged with violating the law just because they do not agree that the best way to help a minor struggling with same-sex attraction is to affirm and encourage their feelings and behaviors. Pastors and others have the right to preach, teach, and counsel consistent with their religious beliefs. It is unacceptable that the city of Sheboygan would seek to infringe on that right in any way. And there's also a claim been made that conversion therapy is harmful to children. Again, we are not talking about very invasive, horrible processes that were done many decades ago. We are talking about talk therapy and also counseling in a religious setting. There is zero scientific evidence connecting conversion therapy to any kind of tangible harm. Children struggling with sexuality or those who desire for their sexuality to align with their faith should be free to talk about these deep and confusing feelings. I would ask that this council vote no on this conversion ban ordinance 
for, again, these reasons. It denies treatment for those with unwanted sexual attractions. Two, it, is, it unconstitutionally engages in viewpoint discrimination and it limits the authority of parents to get counseling, appropriate religious counseling for their minor children and it wrongly limits the free exercise of religion in the city of Sheboygan. Thank you. Thank you. There is no clapping now. Follow the rules, please. Jeffrey Cunard. If you could state your name and address for us, please. Jeffrey Cunard, uh, 74 Lincoln Avenue, Sheboygan. Thank you. You'll have five minutes. Okay. Um, Mayor Vandersteen, uh, members of the Common Council, this, this evening I would like to address the constitutionality of some of the things that are proposed in this law. This law would restrict speech, specifically between a counselor and a patient or a person desiring counseling, telling the counselor he can only speak in a certain manner. Um, this is something that has been passed in multiple cities and is resulting in a lot of litigation throughout the nation. I have a letter here from a civil liberties organization and they have laid out some of the arguments that they have been using. In this one, it's a Supreme Court decision. Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, writing for the majority, rejected the Ninth Circuit's analysis of the First Amendment in pickup and similar analysis adopted by the Cir Third Circuit in King. Some courts of appeals have recognized professional speech as a separate category of speech that is subject to different rules. But this court has not recognized professional speech as a separate category of speech. Speech is not unprotected merely because it is uttered by professionals. In addition, um, um, let's see here. Justice Thomas continued, in some neither California nor the Ninth Circuit has identified a persuasive reason for treating professional speech as a unique category that is exempt from ordinary First Amendment principles. Justice Anthony Kennedy wrote a concurring opinion um, in emphasizing the dangers posed by legislation like Sheboygan's, which targets particular types of speech. It is not forward thinking to force individuals to be an instrument for fostering public adherence to an ideological point of view they find unacceptable. It is forward thinking to begin by reading the First Amendment as ratified in 1791 to understand the history of authoritarian government as the founders then knew it, to confirm that history since then shows how relentless authoritarian regimes are in their attempts to stifle free speech and to carry those lessons onward as we seek to preserve and teach the necessity of freedom of speech for the generations to come. Governments must not be allowed to force persons to express a message contrary to their deepest convictions. Freedom of speech secures freedom of thought and belief. This law imperils those liberties. I believe that if the city enacts this ban on certain types of speech, it puts itself in a position to face significant legal challenges. And so I, I would move that the Common Council reject this legislation. Thank you. Next we'll go on to Mayor's announcements. 
Uh, our City Green project has been quite successful lately. Uh, the, the headline event is the Levitt Amp Concerts and this Thursday, August 8th from 6, from 6 o'clock till 9 o'clock we have two bands. Uh, the Wise Jennings will be on at 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock Adrian and Meredith. There's also some other uh, uh, events that we've uh, programmed to further use that green space. And there's uh, on Saturday, August 10th, there's two events. In the afternoon from noon to four, the planetarium on the green will be available. And that evening from uh, 10, rather four o'clock to uh, 7.30 will be uh, some musical entertainment. Uh, first the gray trio, and then at uh, six o'clock, JP and the Fizz will finish up. We also have a new event that's taking place on Friday, August 16th, and that's a night market. The night market is an open air market in the city green, offering a wide variety of experiences for all background and ages. The night market will feature local makers and entrepreneurs, the mix of art, craft and food vendors, live music, games, a kid zone, a beer garden. They will create a free and vibrant interactive place to build community while celebrating our downtown and 30 years of the SCIO's Sheboygan's Farmer's Market. This is being sponsored by the SCIO and the Harbor Center Business Improvement District. Coming up tomorrow night, August 6th, is our night out, uh, national night out celebration is going to take place at King Park tomorrow. Um, the event is about bringing communities together. It includes food trucks, music from Open Door Entertainment, refreshments and face painting by Target, law enforcement vehicles, fire department equipment, and safety and community related exhibits. There will also be a walk against crime, which will start from King Park at 6.30 p.m. And uh, we're also fortunate to have the Sheboygan Pops Band in our community. And the Pops Concert Band was founded in 1989 to promote band music in the Sheboygan area. And they perform free summer concerts every other Wednesday. The next date is August 7th, starting at 6.30. Okay, next we'll move on to the consent agenda. That'll include items 2.2 through 2.18. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to receive and file all our O's, receive all our C's, and adopt all resolutions and ordinances. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on any of those items? <clears throat> Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll for passage? Nine eyes. Motion passes. Next is uh, reports of officers, and that contains items uh, 3.1 through 3.6, and those will be referred to various committees. Under resolutions, that will include items 4.1 through 4.10, and again, those items will be referred to various mm -hmm. committees. And under reports of committees, Item 5.1 is RC number 93 of 1920 by the Finance and Personnel Committee. To whom is referred resolution number 54 of 1920 by all the persons Donahue and Bourne, authorizing a transfer of appropriations in the 2019 budget and to authorize the appropriate city officials to execute a contract with Clifton Larson Allen LLP and recommends uh, adopting the resolution with amended contract. Alderperson Donahue. Thank you, Mayor. I move to receive the report of the committee and adopt the resolution with the amended contract. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Nine ayes. Motion passes. Next is item 5.2, which is RC number 94 of 1920 by the Finance and Personnel Committee, to whom was referred resolution number 55 of 1920 by Alderpersons Donahue and Bourne, authorizing the appropriate city officials to enter into a contract regarding the bulkhead line survey of the Sheboygan River and Lake Michigan shoreline and recommends adopting the resolution. Alderperson Donahue. Thank you, Mayor. I move to receive the report of the committee and adopt the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? 
Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Nine ayes. Motion passes. Item 5.3 is RC number 95 of 1920 by licensing hearings and public safety committee to whom was referred general ordinance number five of 1920 by Alderperson Sorensons, Ackley, Donahue, Feldy, and Savaglio creating section 70-86 of the municipal code entitled conversion therapy prohibited regulating the practice of conversion therapy with regard to minors and recommends adopting the ordinance. Alderperson Sorensen. Mr. Mayor, I move to receive the RC and adopt the ordinance. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Is there any discussion on the motion? Alderperson Sorensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First off, I want to say how proud I am of the city for stepping up and addressing this issue. Um, I also want to thank all the citizens that have uh, attended here tonight and that have reached out to every single older person to express their views on this issue. I also want to thank our counterparts across the state and working through the League of Municipalities that have provided their experiences in this journey on this issue as well. I also want to uh, thank the experts that have provided their feedback on this topic. Throughout this process, we've heard and worked with, especially myself, have heard from counselors, advocates, lawyers, therapists, clergy, social workers, and citizens with many, many backgrounds to talk about this issue on both sides. I also want to specifically thank those that have expressed and opened up their courage and strength to come forward to share their experiences and their impact and challenges that they've had faced due to conversion therapy. Over the course of several years now, there have been 19 states that have banned this abusive practice, with North Carolina being the newest state to join. Currently, there have been several, state, or several cities across the state of Wisconsin that have passed this ban as well, including Milwaukee, Madison, Eau Claire, Cudahy, Shorewood, and of course, most recently, Racine. A bipartisan bill has been introduced at the state level as well and has been signed on by Democrats and Republicans, with Sheboygan's own Representative Tyler Vorpogel, who represents the 27th Assembly District, signing on with this bill as well. This ban uh, that we are, will be talking about tonight primarily focuses on protecting children and minors within our community. And as elected officials, it's our moral obligation to protect children. This ordinance only focuses on professional licensed therapists, which is a form of medical treatment that is highly already regulated to protect public health and the safety of children. This ordinance does not prohibit or, or any form of First Amendment speech or religious freedom. It does not restrict or apply to clergy or individuals who provide religious instruction as well. It does allow for discussing and advocating viewpoints or beliefs all over the spectrum and from everyone with different backgrounds. Um, this still allows parents to talk and work with their child and best advocate, for the, best advocate for their family and their needs and seek any sort of spiritual guidance that they need. What we are trying to prevent are the abusive science practices that come from forceful quack science practices that are masked as therapy. To put this in a simpler matter, this ordinance only focuses on licensed professional therapists that are practicing conversion therapy. The process of this ordinance, if there's a licensed professional or therapist that is found practicing this, the, the uh, abusive form, not necessarily the talk therapy or counseling that they need, then the city would refer them to the state board that regulates licensed therapists. There are countless professional organizations across the country that have been advocating for banning this practice and have called for this practice to be stopped at all levels of government. Some of these groups include, and I won't read them all, but the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Colleges of Physicians, the American Medical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, American Academy of Nurses, American Academy on Child and Adolescent Psychiat Psychiatric, Psychiatry, excuse me, International Found Federation of Social Workers, National Coalition for Mental Health Recovery, <coughs> as well as Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services, um, and many more that uh, you can look up as well. Um, throughout this process, there has been no scientific or, or scholarly evidence that has supported the effectiveness of conversion therapy. In 2001, the Surgeon General even stated that there is no valid scientific evidence that sexual orientation can be changed. In fact, this practice can be very harmful on minors, which for survivors of this harmful practice, we have seen a large increase in depression, anxiety, drug and alcohol abuse, as well as homelessness and a wide variety of other mental health issues. This, or, this ordinance really addresses the public health issues in a preventative manner. We are now several years into an opioid epidemic, and we need to do whatever we can to prevent youth from being casted out and left out from being, uh, and being caught up in any form of abuse for them to be more susceptible in drug-related activities and coping mechanisms. 
Our city has a lot more work that we need to be done to be more accepting of all people. And every day I work with victims of abuse and it's important to stand up and address any type of abuse, no matter what form it comes in. And conversion therapy has been labeled as a very much form of psychological and in some instances physical abuse. Child abuse thrives in environments and encourages, that encourages denial and ignorance and it's our duty to stand up and prevent that. One accepting child, one accepting, excuse me, one accepting adult of an LGBT teen can reduce the rate of suicide by over 40%. Imagine what message we'll send to LGBT minors in the community if we pass this measure. In a recent local poll, 55% of LGBT people have expressed verbal or have experienced verbal harassment in Sheboygan County. One third of LGBT students in our school district alone have experienced physical harassment and abuse within the schools. We still have so much more work to do. I do want to share a specific message that I did get from a constituent. Um, I leave his name out for confidentiality, but I wanted to thank you for being a sponsor of this legislation. As a newer member, resident of Sheboygan and the LGBT community myself, the fact that this issue is being considered makes me feel much more welcome in this community. I ask that we all support this measure and I ask that you take a stand against child abuse and support having an inclusive community that improves our city's quality of life. With that statement being said, I will hold the floor and I do have some questions regarding some of the language uh, for the bill and I'll ask the city attorney to provide um, some input. So I'm gonna make three points, Chuck, so bear with me here. Um, so one of the, the first questions regarding is, is the fee component of folks that accept a fee for this practice. Can you talk about the, the fee process and what that would entail? Um, what uh, uh, exemptions or what would religious counselors be impacted by this? Um, and, and what impact would have on religious uh, components as well? Um, and then what types of efforts are we sort of defining as conversion fit therapy and the abusive practices? and sort of differentiate between the abusive and then the talk therapy and one-on-one -on -one sort of normal face-to-face -face counseling. So that's my first statement and questions. Go ahead. So I, I think I got your questions down. I think your first question was to ask about the fee component and in 70-86 sub A, uh, sub one, uh, it does indicate that uh, conversion therapy is defined in our proposed ordinance to mean any practice or treatment offered or rendered to consumers for a fee. So what that means is that in order for it to be considered, for a practice to be considered conversion therapy, uh, it would need to be a practice or a treatment, it would have to be offered or rendered to a consumer, and, it, and there would have to be a fee attached to that rendering of that practice or treatment. Um, I understand from speaking to you before that there was some uh, concern uh, about uh, whether uh, simply someone, the fact that somebody is uh, paid to do something, whether that in some way means that they have accepted a fee, uh, that's not the case. They, that in order for this, uh, for, in order for a practice to be considered conversion therapy, there would actually have to be money changing hands for that specific uh, practice. The parent uh, uh, would have to give money, you know, money in exchange for that particular uh, uh, conversion therapy. So it would not cover things like, um, you know, a church, uh, a church elder uh, simply, uh, you know, providing counseling simply because the church has received uh, offerings, uh, that, that kind of thing. That would not be uh, for a fee. Uh, I think your second question had to do with how this would affect uh, religious uh, counselors. And again, that gets into the definition of uh, conversion therapy, which is your third question. So I'm going to kind of handle those uh, together. Uh, I, I think that makes the most sense. Uh, so we do define conversion therapy, uh, and it starts with what, what I've talked about. It's a practice or a treatment. Uh, so, it, it, so it does actually uh, limit it to something that is considered a practice or a treatment. Simply advice uh, is not a practice or a treatment. Um, simply g giving an opinion is not a practice or a treatment, and uh, it's my opinion that that would not be covered under this ordinance and, and could not be prosecuted as such. Um, it does include psychological counseling that seeks to change a person's sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, so uh, the, the most important piece there is that uh, the definition of conversion therapy is an attempt 
to actually change that person's sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, the reason that that's important is oftentimes uh, what uh, pe pe I think there is some concern. Uh, again, that regular counseling where you're just helping somebody to cope um, would in some way be considered conversion therapy. Uh, and uh, as I understand the definition as it's uh, been provided in this ordinance, uh, that would not be considered conversion therapy therapy because it is not specifically designed, the, the, the direction isn't to change uh, the, uh, the uh, behaviors or gender expressions, uh, to change a person's sexual orientation or, or gender identity. And so, uh, in general, uh, religious uh, counselors are, you know, what they're doing is they're uh, providing information about uh, religious beliefs. Uh, obviously, there are many different religious beliefs, even among people of the same religion. Uh, and uh, they're encouraging people to, uh, you know, have a faith component to their life. Uh, as I read this definition of conversion therapy, I, I, I think it would be rather uh, unlikely, uh, I can't say a zero chance, but rather unlikely that a religious counselor is actually engaging in conversion therapy for a fee uh, because they're doing something a little bit different. They're providing counseling. And generally, uh, uh, at least when you're talking about a religious counselor from a church, they're not charging a, a fee uh, to do that. Um, so uh, based, I, I hope I answered your questions, but if, if you have uh, any others, to follow up, I can hopefully answer them. Anything else, Alderperson Sorensen? Not at this moment. Thank you very much. Alderperson Donahue? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Um, as an initial piece, I want to speak to um, some of the constitutional arguments that our um, uh, citizens spoke about tonight. You know, the jurisprudence of freedom of religion versus freedom of speech um, really is accelerating, I think, within uh, the American legal system and provides some interesting, complex, difficult to resolve issues uh, as to how we accommodate competing interests. Um, however, uh, I think, uh, well, maybe I feel even more strongly than Attorney Adams, I think that the Sheboygan County Conversion Therapy Being Prohibited Ordinance will not, cannot, and should not be a vehicle for any jurisprudential examination of those issues. And the reason is people need to actually review what the ordinance has to say. <clears throat> I think by a careful reading of the ordinance, um, we can resolve a lot of concerns and questions. Um, I had a, I've had, a, a, I think most of the alders in the room here have had a number of conversations with people today, um, and a, a very thoughtful person talked to me about um, how do you draw the line between someone who is really exploring or feels depressed or whatever, and how does this particular ordinance impact that? And I think that uh, sub A sub 1 says specifically that conversion therapy does not include counseling that provides assistance to a person undergoing gender transition or counseling that provides acceptance, support, and understanding of a person or facilitates a person's coping, social support, and identity exploration and development, and then it goes on with the exclusion as long as such counseling does not seek to change an individual's sexual orientation or gender identity, as, as Attorney Adams said. Um, the caller and I both agreed, we both chuckled a little bit, that, um, uh, you know, it's, <clears throat> as we grow up, we go through a lot of different transitions and we have a lot of questions and such, and the good thing about this particular ordinance is that it in no way, shape, or forms, form constricts, eliminates, constrains that kind of therapy. The second uh, point that I think is important is to really emphasize, and I thank uh, Attorney Adams for clarification about a fee. What we're talking about here are licensed therapists who uh, provide treatment to children, adolescents, adults, whomever, those people who are licensed therapists are governed by 
And I suppose, in a sense, their freedom of speech is somewhat restricted <coughs> by a code of ethics. Many professions have codes of ethics, and that would include doctors, physicians, nurses, social workers, <coughs> psychologists, financial planners. Um, I understand engineers might have a code of ethics, although I, I can't speak to that exactly. But, um, and the reason for this is that we understand that these people do very important things and interact with people in very important ways. And just like I can't stand up in a theater and yell fire without my free speech being impinged upon by a disorderly conduct charge, those kinds of professionals are really need to be very thoughtful, considerate, and adhere to basic rules about the practice of, of their profession. As uh, Alder Sorensen said, multiple, and I believe Dr. Smith, multiple um, therapeutic organizations have taken the position that is an ethical violation to practice conversion or reparative therapy. So what we're looking at essentially is if we had a therapist, a, a certified licensed therapist in the city who was performing this kind of, of therapy, the, the remedy, the way we would solve that problem is to report that person to the state of Wisconsin's, I'm not finding it exactly, the state of Wisconsin's regulation department. Uh, those are the folks who look over the licenses of, of many professionals. So, constitutional challenges here based on the careful definition and the specific carving out of exceptions, I think truly shields this from any kind of constitutional uh, concern. But even more importantly, and this is just what I want to say to wrap it up, um, to my mind and why I'm supporting it, and I respect the folks who aren't, I really do, but the reason I'm supporting this is that I grew up here and this city has changed in the most marvelous and wondrous kinds of ways. It challenges us, those of us who are the oldsters here, but enormous doors of diversity and inclusion have been opened in the city. And our city is prospering as a result. I mean, multiple, the mayor is always sending us a new accolade that the city has received. You know, 10th best city in, this, in, in the state to live in, and ARP says this, and another organization says that. We are doing well in holding ourselves out as an important, interesting, vibrant place to live. We need, among ourselves, I think, to be open and affirming and inclusive of all people. And I think that in, uh, this, this ordinance is very, very limited on its face, but even this limitation, I think, sends a message of welcome and protection to the LGBTQ community, and that's why I'm firmly in favor of it. Thank you for your comments. Any other discussion? Well, I, like many of you, had, go ahead, Alder Person Born. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, just a, a little background on how this thing came about is this went to uh, Alderman Sorens's uh, Public Safety Committee, and it's my understanding to talk, talking with one of the members of the committee that there were no members of the public there to give any testimony at the committee level, and it was voted on unanimously in committee. Uh, I understand, and even myself, I probably neglected to look at that agenda, or I perhaps would have been there at least to listen in. This type of a topic historically in my 13 years on the council that creates a lot of public interest, in my opinion, should have gone to the committee of the whole. And for the audience that doesn't know what the committee of the whole is, that's when all of the aldermen get together to, to uh, discuss uh, topics of interest to the public where we have an unlimited amount of time to listen to the public on both sides of an issue. And in this case, I would have hoped that it would have brought in uh, professionals uh, in the uh, psychological field. It would, it would have had invited uh, clergy members of all faiths to give their opinion on this. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and talking to the city clerk today, 
We had five people that spoke tonight. She had 12 on the waiting list uh, as backups in case somebody didn't show up. And many, 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 many more phone calls of people that wanted to speak tonight that did not have the opportunity. So that, that I felt is, is a shortcoming and uh, I'm not prepared to make a motion on that at this time, but I think we should think about this, that we should open this up to the community that everybody that wants to speak has a chance to speak. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, one of the people that spoke on the uh, public forum, uh, I believe it was Mrs. Uh, trying to read, uh, Mrs. Bailey made some very, very good points on what uh, this therapy is now compared to what it was years ago. And my great concern is that uh, when people go in to talk to their clergy and get counseling from the clergy, and then they go to other professionals, and these other professionals are not really able, I think, by this ordinance to give you what I would call neutral therapy. In other words, talking to the child in depth of when, when, when this, uh, these feelings started and how they progressed. And uh, to me, the way the ordinance is written, particularly in uh, uh, whereas number four, it seems to give more preference to uh, being pro that lifestyle rather than being more neutral. And I have a real problem with that. And as the, as the speaker said in the public forum, conversion therapy is not what it used to be. Uh, some of those horror stories from years ago with, uh, with some of those very various treatments. And I think uh, uh, professionals should have the opportunity to give uh, a balanced therapy look at all aspects of, of what the child is going through. I also have a, a question for Attorney Adams. Uh, Attorney Adams, uh, looking at the statutes, the state statutes that uh, have to do with psychology, uh, psychiatrists and psychologists, I understand that maybe their code of ethics maybe says something about conversion therapy, but a, a code of ethics is not a state statute. If, we, if this would pass and we would refer somebody to the state, the way the statutes for the licensing board for psychologists uh, and other therapists is written, uh, is it illegal, uh, according to those licensing boards, for those professionals to do conversion therapy? And just to follow up on that before you answer, I find it odd that the state legislature in the last session would have a bill, never got a vote, and there's a, another bill, bipartisan bill, which I'm glad to see that's coming through again. Uh, why would the legislature go to the trouble of having bills if it's already covered by the licensing boards of these professionals? Thank you. So uh, your question is, what would be the result of uh, a referral to the state of Wisconsin? And you're right that there, the state of Wisconsin has not banned conversion therapy in and of itself. However, the uh, division or the Department of Safety and Professional Services does regulate therapy services. And it, likely what would happen would be an investigation done into whether they're violating uh, any of the regulations, not simply the statutes, because uh, as you probably understand, the, the state statutes, you know, there's only a couple thousand pages of them, there's hundreds of thousands probably of, of, of regulations. And there would be a determination made if the in the very specific situation that's being referred to them, whether there was a violation of the regulations under which they practice. Does that mean that in every single case there will be a determination that a, a, a particular um, a reason that, a, you know, a particular referral will result in some kind of punishment from the state? No, it, it doesn't mean that. In the same way that a referral to the police when there's a belief that somebody has violated a criminal statute or a, or a, a city ordinance doesn't always result in a prosecution. Um, so, uh, but there, there are regulations uh, that would be looked into. And, and frankly, because we're limiting this uh, to um, licensed professionals, my understanding is that the concern basically is to make sure that the licensed professionals are acting up to the professional standards. And generally the belief is, uh, of those who, uh, the proponents of this ordinance, is that those licensed therapists who are actually practicing conversion therapy are likely not meeting the professional standards 
uh, of their practice, but the state would have to make that determination. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? Um, as I said earlier, I've got a lot of phone calls from a lot of people on this issue. Alderperson Sorensen? Okay. And, um, you know, many times when we consider ordinances like this, we look at enforcement. How do we enforce this? So if somebody is providing that service and obtains a payment for it, how are we going to know? If somebody hears about it and they come and tell us about it, Chuck, what do we do? How would we manage that? Well, so, and that of course was uh, the rub in uh, drafting this ordinance because uh, there, are, there have been a number of different proposals as to how to enforce it. Uh, this, uh, our current provision uh, actually uh, builds on uh, the village of Shorewood, Shorewood's provision, uh, which basically says that if we get uh, a complaint like that, it gets referred uh, to the state of Wisconsin Department of Safety and Professional Services. So there would not be a citation issued, but rather the enforcement taken is a referral to uh, the professional agency that, that regulates uh, uh, those counselors. So if we get a third party person accusing somebody, then we would, would initiate that action? Yes, we, we would make that referral. I would imagine that there would at least be a basic determination of whether there's any, you know, I mean, some, somebody could not just simply come in and make a baseless uh, complaint, but I think based on uh, at least a, a <coughs> you know, a, a basic level case that, that this is happening, we would then simply refer it and the remainder of the investigation would fall upon the state. But would we, in trying to determine that, have to have our detectives department uh, investigate that? Again, that's gonna depend on the specific allegations uh, being made, but it would not require that, no. And then when you were responding to Alderperson Sorensen, you said something about we would be prosecuting someone. Where does that come into it? A prosecution just simply means enforcing uh, an ordinance. Okay, thank you. Alderperson Sorensen, did you have any other comments? Yes. Go, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just kind of responding to Alderperson Boren's comments um, before. This ordinance, as it's written, would not prevent any form of balance therapy or any form of talk therapy. Um, as uh, we stated before as well, that still would be allowed. The ordinance is, that is written not really looking at the whereas is clause, more looking at the, the ordinance in itself. Um, this only focuses on, on, on the specific practice that is looking to push a certain way um, in a, that is done by a licensed professional. So I, in, 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 am I correct in that sort of assessment, Attorney Adams, too, that the way that the ordinance is written, that sort of balance neutral, still talking one-on-one, um, -on -one, getting spiritual advice, all that stuff is still allowed? That, that's my read of it, yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank I, you. I, oh, go ahead. Still have a continuing comment. Um, I do just want to quick summarize a quick statement that I did get uh, from another constituent as well, too. Um, today, as you vote to discuss this important issue uh, called conversion therapy against, is against the code of ethics of the psych psychology, psychiat psychiatric social work associations, deemed as having a traumatic side effect on those in this practice on an addition of the facts that is not possible for people's understanding or sexual orientation or gender identity evolves as we all do evolve. Yes, but it is not short-natured, supported or affirmed, nor condemned, or should be forced out of people. Morality is a futile and abusive, pra an abusive practice that is questioning the dignity and worth of people and people who, are we, who inherently we are. It is also making a narcissistic and moral assumption that we know more than our maker. In my faith, as we are made by God and God's image, and likeliness of no mistakes or accidents of all of us. I know that God that I have studied and worked and loved for all these years unconditionally affirms and didn't condemn any form of life, genders, or attractions. They make all, all of us imperfectly. They know that we are worth of love and safety, and they're still speaking as far after as the church, United Church of Christ is concerned. Conversion therapy, especially when practiced on minors, is questioning the validity of God's design and God's rationale love of all of us. And the statement was provided by Reverend Lex Cade White, which she wanted me to share tonight as well. So, again, thank you. Thank you. Alderperson Boren. Thank you again, Mayor. 
Uh, I forgot to refer to the eighth whereas in the document, and I'll just read it, and then I have a question about it, uh, probably for the city attorney. Uh, whereas data from the state of Wisconsin Youth Risk Behavior Survey, uh, YRBS, done in 2017, indicates that 41% of youth survey surveyed that are LGBT have considered suicide versus 16.4% overall. One in two LBGT students reports depression versus 27% uh, overall and 67% of LB, uh, LGBT students report anxiety uh, versus 40% overall. My question is, Attorney Adams, uh, the statistic that I, that I just read off, that does not infer that this group has had conversion therapy? Uh, where did those, uh, why was that put in the document? So the whereas clauses are in there basically uh, to provide a basis for why the city is uh, uh, at wanting to, to pass this ordinance. So you'll have to make the determination for yourself whether that's, uh, you know, whether that's a uh, valid connection to uh, conversion therapy. Uh, but the, the whereas clause, you know, is, is just that. It's a whereas clause that provides uh, information uh, to help uh, you make a decision one way or the other. But that's not, a, that's not an inference, though, that those statistics are indicative of somebody that's gone through con conversion therapy. You, you can infer whatever you'd like out of them, and you can infer them. Yeah, I, I, nobody's telling you to infer one conclusion or another out of them. Uh, I, just want, I just want to say that uh, I appreciate all the calls and emails that I received over the weekend. And it was about 50-50 on people that wanted it banned and people that didn't want it banned. Uh, I am not going to support banning it tonight. However, if I would get uh, more information possibly through a committee of the whole meeting for, for some, from some professionals and clergy members, uh, I, may, I may possibly would vote to ban it. But on what I've heard so far from constituents and the people that I've heard tonight at the public forum, I am not going to, at this time, ban the conversion therapy. So just to see if there's support out there for this going to the Committee of the Whole for further discussion, I'm going to make a motion that this be referred to the Committee of the Whole. Is there a, we have a motion and a second to refer to the Committee of the Whole. Is this debatable? Okay, so this is not debatable. Um, I'd ask the clerk to call the roll. I is to refer, correct? I is to refer. Three ayes, six noes. Motion fails. So we're back to the main motion that's on the floor. Is there any further discussion? Other person, uh, Feldy. Thank you, Mayor. I'm speaking on my support for banning conversion therapy. I am on the licensing hearing and public safety committee and we did discuss it there and there were there was no one there to speak for or against. We did ask some questions of the attorney. Um, I've received a list of all of the prof professional organizations that are opposed to um, or in favor of, of banning conversion therapy. Um, there are some very prominent organizations there. And as uh, someone who worked in education for almost 30 years, um, I have a deep understanding of, of teenagers and the struggles that they go through in those years. Um, I've raised two of my own children. Uh, 
it's not an easy time for them and we're not telling the parent what they can and cannot do for their child um, we're just telling the therapist more or less where their boundaries are um, at least that's the way I'm taking taking this all to be happening and um, I apologize to all the constituents that that phoned and emailed me and answered as many as I could um, and for those of you that I didn't get back to um, I, I did keep track and the same as um, older person born um, it's coming pretty close it's, it's about 50 50 so um, I guess I'll be voting my conscience thank you thank you for your comments older person Decker Do you want to speak? No. Okay. Any other discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? Eight eyes, one no. Motion passes. Next item on the agenda is general ordinances. Items 6.1 through 6.3 will be referred to various committees. Under matters laid over, uh, resolution 7.1 is resolution number 53 of 1920 by Alderperson Wolf and Ackley officially recognizing the End Park Neighborhood Association. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I'm looking to, um, to re request and, and adopt uh, the resolution, and I also want to state that this is another example. We'll take a brief uh, remiss until the, we empty the gallery. Alder Person Wolf, I think you can continue then. Thank you, Mayor. First off, I'd like to, to uh, thank the, the neighborhood group called N Park Association and welcome them to, hopefully welcome them to the uh, Neighborhood Association. Uh, they've worked very hard, just like others, and we're looking forward to having more neighborhood associations. So I, I ask that uh, we adopt the resolution. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. Would the clerk please call the roll? <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry, Chad. I just want to state and follow up on uh, President Wolf's comments that the end part neighborhood is the city's 10th official neighborhood, so we are celebrating that. <laughs> and in doing so, we're going to have a little celebration in September, later on in September that we'll be inviting you guys to in our neighborhood leaders as well as we uh, embark on the next 10 neighborhoods. Thank you for those comments, Chad. Want me to do a place for you? All those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Uh, next item is other matters authorized by law. I'll turn it over to our city attorney, Charles Adams. 8.1 is an RO by the city clerk submitting various license applications for the period ending December 31, 2019, June 30, 2020, and June 30, 2021. That will be referred to licensing hearings and public safety committee. Uh, next is the contemplated cold, closed session. Alderperson Wolf. Thank you, Mayor. I make a motion to convene in closed session under the exemption provided in section 19.85 sub 1 sub e Wisconsin stats where competitive and bargaining reasons 
require a closed session related to the possible sale of city-owned property at 229 South Pier Drive. Second. Thank you for that motion and support. The city clerk, please call the roll for closed session. Nine eyes. Motion passes. We'll take a two minute recess and reconvene in closed session shortly. For the people viewing tonight, uh, this will end our transmission and we'll be adjourning in closed session.